Welcome. Everything is a trillion different realities folding onto each other like thin sheets of metal forming a single blade. You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode 12, GDC's The Time Knife. It was written by Christopher Ensel and Joe Mandy, directed by Jude Wang, and it aired January 17th, 2019. Michael and the gang enter the interdimensional hole of pancakes to meet the judge. She augments their reality so they feel as though they're in a real IHOP. Jason and Janet decide to go on a date once everything settles. Michael argues that each choice carries unintended consequences, but the judge isn't buying it. Jason makes an impassioned speech on the human condition, and Jen agrees to try life on Earth. Huh? Okay, so, <laughs> this episode. Um, so in the first scene... Uh, I noticed after rewatching it a couple times, um, that there's somebody who's like floating in that space and it turns out like it was confirmed by Mark Evan Jackson on Twitter that that's Trevor. So when the judge shushed him away in episode four or something, he's just been like floating out there ever since. That sucks. Yeah. It's good <laughs> punishment though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They definitely added some tubes and things to that catwalk scene that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. A blimp. Yep. A... Very cool. Wondering mm -hmm. what the blimp's all about. Or is it just supposed to be old timey? A blimp is old timey, right? They're not going to have a 747. I wonder if that was something that Janet conjured accidentally. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's just stuck out there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I didn't know what to call that area. The, the catwalks, the interdimensional scaffolding. Um, <laughs> walkways to eternity. Ooh. Or, you know. <laughs> hmm. I like that. The walkway to eternity. Mm -hmm. The interdimensional... Scaffolding. Scaffolding. That's good. It's like That's fancy good. and then lowbrow. <laughs> fancy and then not. <laughs> we get to see Nervous Cheaty again for like a moment. Yeah. Which is great. It feels authentic. Yes. So once they get into the IHOP... What did you think of that scene? How did you feel? Because it's so different. Like, the look is so different right. than every other episode, right? Yeah, as Tahani says, it's Diane von Furstenberg pattern from spring 2013, which is accurate. I looked those up, and they are not that bad. They're, they're not great. I mean, they're fine. They're kind of, like, abstract and yeah. cool. I didn't think they looked that bad. To me... I would wear some of them. I'm just saying... <laughs> To me, the IHOP looked like um, something from Wonderland, but underwater. Like Alice in Wonderland? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't really like it. No, it was kind of dumb. No, it, it's <laughs> not that it was dumb. It just reminded me a lot of like a Bloodstream animation. You know, when they're showing you like all the individual little right. cells. The cells floating past. Yeah, and... floating through your veins. And then it kind of made me feel a little bit like nauseous because of that i don't know i just don't like thinking about body functions it grosses me out mm -hmm. um as far as i know i am filled with candy and i'm fine with it <laughs> <laughs> and i felt like it was so blue that it was really distracting like i was trying to feel the emotion of jason telling janet you know i think i have feelings for you and i was just so distracted by the environment that I found mm -hmm. it really hard to pay attention to the scene the first time I watched it. Yeah, and there's all these like floaty, swirly things in the background, kind of like coral or I don't know, like they're... veins or it was yeah, it was kind of weird. It, yeah, it was just bizarre. I wasn't a fan of it. Um I'm really happy that we only spent a very short period of time mm -hmm. in the IHOP, the like real IHOP. Um but I did like, and I did notice the first time we were watching it too, I did like the inclusion of the need noggle. Um, it's like this slug thing, right? And it's actually a shout out to David Need Noggle, who does special effects for the show. Oh my god. That's... And they <laughs> like they bring up his name all the time on the Good Place, the podcast. Uh -huh. So immediately I knew what it was. So he's a special effects coordinator? Mm hmm Okay. He's like the guy. They love him. So it was it was kind of just like a joke 
like an inside joke, really. Like it doesn't actually add anything to the episode. No, I don't know if that's going to pay off at any point, but I really doubt it. We didn't have any resolution to it. I mean, it was a funny joke with the scarf um, later uh-huh. on and, you know, to honey being like, oh, it's such a cute, cute scarf. No, it's actually still the knee dongle. We also have no idea what it would have done to Tahani. They just say, no, don't touch it. Yeah. Well, it's more intriguing if we don't know. That's true. It keeps you guessing. Keeps you guessing. Mm -hmm. So again, like you mentioned, Jason has no idea where he is or what's going on around him. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Taking too much salvia sounds about right. Yep. Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jason doesn't really get what's going on, but he's still very sensitive and honest about his feelings when he's talking to Janet, which is really sweet. And we get the, the, the famous, I'm not a girl line again, Yes. but it's spoken so differently this time. Like mm-hmm. to me, it's sh- J- Jan is a lot less sure of herself when she says it. She says it very much more emotionally, like with more emotion, mm. but it's no longer like the upbeat, like not a girl. I'm not a girl, not a girl, not a robot. Yep. Yeah. Like. Everything she's not. Yeah, right? it was very much like, I'm not a girl. Oh, I felt but... it was more like, well, I'm going to gently remind him here, I'm not a girl, but, but I, I would a... like to go on a date with you. Yeah, because she's <laughs> having these girly emotions. Yeah, but she's not going to be a girlfriend. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. Back to Tahani's outfit, just because I mentioned the scarf earlier i think this outfit change with that scarf and that particular dress might be my favorite look of tahani's ever (laughs) i don't know why i think she looks great with the scarf it makes her look even taller in a weird way extends her neck maybe oh maybe maybe Hmm. yeah tahani looking good in this if you don't see a lot of her if you asked me what color it was i wouldn't be able to tell you or what color her dress was oh man i definitely i think the scarf was blue but it's green. <laughs> it's green. Okay. <laughs> it's like a great darkish green. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no idea what anybody was wearing like ever. <laughs> I noticed that Eleanor wears a lot of like stripes on her shirts. A lot generally like, you know, kind of right above the chest area. Um, I like those shirts. I actually think they look really nice on her. Hmm. I'm just... Wondering if there's something that they're trying to say because she's always wearing them. It's broadening her shoulders and making her look more intimidating. (laughs) Horizontal stripes. That's why Eleanor does it. Yeah, to make herself look more intimidating so people back off. Taking up more space. You know what? Go ahead, Eleanor. Take up that space. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And we get the judge again. Maya Rudolph, Mm -hmm. back for more. Yes, love her. And, of course, as soon as she's he's cheaty, she hits on him. Oh. And when she does, I love it. Eleanor, like, slowly puts herself between them, like, in a protective <laughs> stance. I thought that was really cute. And they both just look so confused. Yeah. <laughs> so once we're finally in the restaurant-looking IHOP, um, and Michael is arguing his point, and Jen's saying, well, okay, fine, yeah, life is complicated, whatever and you get and it's really nice in a way that jason is the one who actually has that moment that convinces her because we're getting a good mix of jason being a doofus but also being a strange genius like he's been before and i really appreciate that because i feel like we've been pushing so hard on this like idiot jason Mm -hmm. and i still wanted to see that he had that kind of like You know, he has these strange stories that don't always seem to make sense. And then at the end, he wraps it up and it, you know what he's saying. It's like he gets it. He gets it, but he doesn't quite get that he gets it until he starts talking. I don't know. It's like his brain makes the connection before he does, Mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Yeah, we haven't seen a whole lot of that in action lately, so it was really nice. And then when he's making that point, It just felt so familiar and I feel like, and maybe I'm misremembering it, like maybe I had this thought in my head but I didn't vocalize it, but I feel like I made this point back in season two that it's really unfair of Jen to judge humanity when she doesn't understand 
what life is like on Earth. She doesn't understand what humans go through and all the intricacies of living on this planet. Right. And industrialization, globalization, capitalization, <laughs> you know, capitalism and everything. Like, it's just, there's too much for you to stay impartial. Yeah, right? don't judge me till you've taken a walk in my shoes. Yeah. It's that kind of idea, right? Maybe she did. Maybe she did way, way back when it was Og and Grog. And mm. she doesn't realize how much it's changed. Perhaps. I mean, she does watch, like... A lot of television. She watches a lot of TV, right? So you would think that she has, like, a basic understanding. But she must have thought that those were overly dramatized or something to not realize that, yeah, it is as complicated and and oftentimes even more so when it's not a tv show right real life is a lot more complicated yeah i mean it is a good argument that she has um you chose this tomato if you don't want the consequences do the research and buy another tomato it's it makes sense but there's a lot more to it. She's oversimplifying, like way oversimplifying. Oh, big time. You can absolutely do the research and choose to shop at a local grocery store versus, you know, big corps, you know, food plant emporium. Mm -hmm. But you're still, all these unintended consequences are still there. Like the idea is there, but it's way oversimplified. And not only that, and I'm just going to skip ahead in a way. Uh, because it's so relevant now. So we got a message from Anna at Anna MCG on Twitter. And she wrote to us, while I agree that in a perfect world, it would be great to stop supporting places once we know they have terrible CEOs or ca cause bad consequences to others. It takes economic privilege to be able to draw those lines. Some people have little choice but to shop at Walmart and that shouldn't keep them out of the bad place. Some people are housebound and have little choice but to shop at Amazon, and that shouldn't keep them out of the bad place either. So basically, is this heaven as we know on the show only a place that privileged people can get into? Right. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I know that certain communities, like places that you can only fly into uh, in northern Canada, rely a lot on, you know... Amazon Prime where they can get things delivered via plane and it is so much cheaper for them because a 24 pack of like bottles of water is over a hundred dollars there. It's ridiculous. Because right? of all the cost to get it there. Exactly. The transportation fees is added into everything and it's just so difficult to maintain a lifestyle there mm -hmm. that certain things they really rely on that and it would be difficult like, so difficult to not use some of these services, even if the CEO is a piece of garbage, right. like Amazon's. Yeah, like, I would love to buy organic everything and, like, local farm fresh everything, but it's really expensive. I just it's, can't afford it. It's super expensive to eat really healthy, um, especially in the way that, like, our Western culture makes, you know, like, certain things healthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really... It's frustrating. It's really judgmental. Um, to look at it and say, oh, well, it's that simple. It's not. It's absolutely not. Yeah. Anna's totally right. So then I kind of hope that, like, Jen actually did get a chance to go down and see how difficult it is if you're living in poverty to make some of those choices. Mm -hmm. Just as a little tidbit, while Michael's doing this presentation to Jen, the tomato presentation, um, it appears that the accounting department has a way to track timelines using Jeremy Baramy what there's a i didn't see that there's a little citation under one of the points uh that says from barami 211 gg1 et ppp one p <laughs> so obviously that's some sort of method of tracking they were or a reference the number part of the jeremy barami yeah probably on the you know yeah. bottom of the y <laughs> whatever yeah so i thought that was kind of neat when when michael's explaining this to jen this is, from what we understand, this is the group's first time hearing why the system is flawed. Oh, right. Yeah. And I'm kind of bummed that we didn't see, like, I don't know, a reaction or anything, mm. because that was literally, literally <laughs> the point of this season. The whole season was them trying to figure out how to get into the good place and why the system is flawed. 
they just found out and there's nothing. <laughs> no reaction, no cheating going, holy shit, Michael, you're fucking right. No, you're totally right, actually. There's a lot of moments in this episode where we're kind of just like glossing over explaining things to people. We act like they already know. Like, Chidi acts like he already knows and has given this some thought. Perhaps. I'm gonna... Okay. What if we just imagine that he told them that on the... What did you call it? Interdimensional Um, scaffolding? Right. Prior to this episode beginning. Okay. You know, on the other part. It was a long walk. It it was a very long walk. It was a very big catwalk. Yeah, I didn't really think about that, but now I am a little disappointed that we didn't get something even just like the tail end of a conversation or some sort of reaction in that scene now did you see that little video floating around where william jackson harper was teaching ted danson to do the floss dance it's pretty great yeah it is a great scene you and got now we Kristen know why supervising and i just thought it was them goofing off like between takes or something and someone yeah. had mentioned the dance and ted just wanted to know how to do it but I guess it was just in this episode. I wasn't expecting to ever see him do that dance. Yeah. I have no idea where it comes from. The kids at work tell me that it's totally, like, not cool anymore. Um, And (laughs) they were making fun of me because I didn't know how to do it. And then I figured out how to do it. But it's not cool now. (laughs) Okay, well, strap yourself in. Buckle up. Mm Because I'm going to give you a little history lesson on the backpack kid. Oh, okay. I also didn't know that that was a thing. I just saw the dance somewhere. Yeah, it was it was popularized by this kid, uh, Russell Horning from the States, who performed the dance with Katy Perry on SNL. Oh. He was videoed doing the dance, and then it went viral, and so he went on SNL, naturally. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many people believe that he created the dance, mm. which has been known as flossing, but he didn't. Um, the earliest recording online is from 2011 and somebody was calling it the mashed potato, but (laughs) that's... Isn't the mashed potato a different dance? Yes, it is. Uh, further confusing the fact that it's not actually the mashed potato at all, but an entirely different dance move. The actual mashed potato. (laughs) The actual mashed potato. (laughs) Such weird names, anyway. (laughs) Was popularized in 1959 by James Brown but likely got its name from being used in the D.D. Sharp song, Mashed Potato Time. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Backpack Kid Dance. Time? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's pretty great. But the mashed potato is like that heel-clicking thing from the 50s and 60s. <laughs> it's like that weird, you okay. know it when you okay, see it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Trust me. Anyway, back to the Backpack Kid. It was further popularized by the computer game... And Nintendo, Xbox, etc. game, Fortnite. Because oh, okay. in Fortnite, you can emote or do a little dance. And there's a whole bunch of different dances your character can do. And after this Backpack Kid dance, this flossing thing became popular, they added it into the game. And these are things that people can purchase as, like, a oh. microtransaction. Okay. And Backpack Kid is actually suing Fortnite for using his dance against, like, without his permission. Oh. But he doesn't own the dance. So that's where all the confusion's coming in. Like, people are like, well, why are you suing them if you didn't make the dance? They hmm. don't need to ask your permission. But I think it's the likeliness hmm. because I think they put it in a backpack in the game. And I don't know. It's stupid. Yeah, that's right, a little uh, backpack kid flossing history lesson. Okay. I guess that's why all the younger kids are flossing now. Fortnite. It just sounds like people are doing like proper dental hygiene all the time, and I don't. Yo, do you know I, how to floss? I, uh, uh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, I don't have any on me. <laughs> it's just this, anyway. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> all right, so let's move on. When Jen returns, she acknowledges it's hard to always make good decisions, and she accepts that humans may be better than their point total suggests. She summons Sean into a meeting. He maintains that humans are fundamentally bad, but Michael reminds everyone how these four humans changed and became better people in the afterlife. Chidi suggests the experiment be repeated with new subjects. Ooh. (laughs) Ooh. Ah! Okay, so let's back up, let's back up. Jen returns. Rewind. 
And I absolutely love the joke, but like very real call out uh, when Jen says, and I guess I'm black and they do not like black ladies down there. Yikes. True fact. Sad. Ugh. Anyway. So obviously as soon as she goes to Earth, she realizes it's a huge shirt show and Michael drives home the idea of the unintended consequences, mm -hmm. which was the title of our last episode. <laughs> um, and then we get the great Chick-fil-A name drop. Well, mm. almost name drop. Yeah. And Chidi was right all along with the almonds. Absolutely. friggin lootly All along. Yeah. We also get a call out to neo-Nazis and... Again. Limp Biscuit. Yep. Yep. So... And slavery. Yeah, slavery. Awful. Yep. All bad. Just racism in general. Terrible. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I really like that we get to see Sean again. It's been so long. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also, like, we don't catch him up on all of Michael's doings. And we don't catch him up on Michael's revelation about unintended consequences either. We just kind of, like, go right into it. Yeah, Jen kind of yeah. explains it a little like, bit. Not really, though. Like, not enough to have proper context. So, I don't know. We're just going to hand wave that, I guess. Yeah. So then when they're discussing this, Sean says, the score that they got on Earth is how good or bad they are. And we've discussed this a lot of times before, um, how the humans continue to grow and change in the afterlife. And how this idea that... Everyone stops changing the moment that they die is ridiculous. Like, well, are, the are, idea. Are these four humans really the first people to ever improve or regress? Yes. In the afterlife? Because of the situation that Michael put them in. But the thing is, even if you were in the good place or something, if you had been amazing your entire life and you go to the good place, who's to say that you're not going to be like, oh, great, now I don't even have to try and you become kind of a jerk? Or... Because that wouldn't be a good person to begin with if they felt like that. But the thing is, it's not, it's not taking account, I don't know, like, if you look at the point system, it's just kind of like unintended consequences, blah, blah, blah. So if you're, you know, the type of person who bought, who grows your own tomatoes on, you know, off the grid, whatever, and you have very little unintended consequences. You to supply your, your own fertilizer. So even if someone was trying to do that because they cared about the environment or their fellow man, blah, 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 things are different in the afterlife, right? There are no stakes, right? You're already there. They're most likely not going to kick you out, right? So you could decide, ah, I'm just going to be kind of a loaf now. I'm just going to sit around and I'm just going to do what I want and... You know, I'll blow people off and whatever. Like, you can do that suddenly now. I'm just saying, there's a possibility, and it seems ridiculous to me, that people would never change either improving or regressing. It just seems bizarre. Well, I don't feel like everyone stays at the same level throughout their life on Earth. I'm going to argue with you. <sighs> I'm going to argue for the sake of arguing and also because... <laughs> Partially, I think that this is the type of good place that we're dealing with. The type of people that would get in would never even consider blowing somebody off or doing a bad thing, even if the stakes are gone. Like, even though they already got there, they got their final place, they're content, they're happy. These aren't the type of people who'd be like, well, now I can, like, slack off for the rest of eternity. Because... That's just the nature of this good place. What if you, like, barely got in? You, like, scraped by? That's still pretty high standards. Like, it's top 5% or whatever. Or I mean, it's not, but it's really... Yeah, but it wasn't that hard to get in there in, you know, 1237. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay, fine. So fine. we're just going to fundamentally well... disagree about this. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can both have differing opinions. I know. <laughs> and yet we could both still get into the good place. Probably not, though. <laughs> not based on their rules. My face was just like, mm, unlikely, but okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, I guess it just it continues to bother me, this idea that people are... Oh, 
always just going to be one thing, you know, always good or always bad for the mm-hmm. rest of lo- for the rest of their life, no matter what. I wonder if people have been changing and getting better and getting worse. Just nobody's keeping track. Nobody's paying attention to these good neighborhoods. What's the point in keeping a total anymore, right? right. Exactly. So maybe that's another situation that they haven't even considered. Mm-hmm. Let's back up a little bit. Okay. Jen reimagines the IHOP as a little conference room and office area. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's this painting behind Jen that I was very curious about. It's like a nice abstract acrylic uh, piece. And I looked it up and it's literally called Abstract Acrylic Canvas Painting Background. And it's a stock photo. It's a, <laughs> it's a stock painting from iStockPhoto.com. So I imagine like Jen just was like, I got to populate a room. Let's just grab a bunch of random things. And oh, here's a stock painting. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I took a screenshot of that section, cut out the painting, Google searched it and found a bajillion results from stock websites. (laughs) That's fantastic though. Because that actually works in the story. Like there's no reason for her to go fancy on anything. It's just like, we just need a regular... Conference room, that's it. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, populate it with a bunch of random stuff. Yeah, done. <laughs> Stock photo, done. Um, oh. Also, in this scene, Jason's holding a clear plastic cup hmm. full of liquid. It looks like water. There's no plastic cups in sight. Everything is glass. Although the glasses are tall and thin, the jugs of water are untouched. I don't know where he got this. And in some scenes, it doesn't look like water. It looks like it's been, I guess, slightly off color. Hmm. So I think there might be like, uh, I don't know, like a deleted scene, hopefully, maybe, to explain Hmm. this cup of mysterious liquid. Or, shocking twist, Manny Jacinto was feeling quite thirsty that day. (laughs) That's a possibility as well. (laughs) But yeah. I feel like there's got to be some deleted scenes in this episode. Yeah, really everything felt kind of rushed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a l- there's so much to put in this episode, though. It makes sense that it would feel a little rushed. Yeah. So do we want to skip to the title of the episode? Yeah. Okay. So the line about the time knife and even really just that happening in general seemed kind of pointless. Like a throwaway? Yeah, I didn't really get why we would name an entire episode after it other than to potentially mislead people or to just put something that didn't really have any relevance to the episode in so that no one would guess right, what like was happening. Right, like for us, last episode, we theorized about what the could, what, what it could mean. Like, right. oh, is there going to be some time travel? Like all sorts of things. Is he going to see like a chef use like a time knife in the IHOP? Like... <laughs> All sorts of things. And maybe it was just for that reason, to just screw people up. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past Michael Schur to do that. (laughs) So, yeah. It kind of reminded me of uh, a book called The Subtle Knife, which is part two of the His Dark Materials trilogy, Mm. the the sequel to The Golden Compass. Uh, In this book, the subtle knife has a blade so sharp that it can cut through the multiverse, basically. It can cut Mm. through dimensions. And you can go to other realities. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of. Nice the multiverse blade. shout out Yeah, there. I know, right? <laughs> didn't know whether you caught that one. <laughs> oh, I did. Yeah, so I, I kind of agree. Like, it didn't really seem to go anywhere. And Yeah, I mean, it was funny to see, like, a tiny little cheaty floating around, screaming. and But really, my favorite part of that was when Eleanor yelled out, Can someone catch my tiny boyfriend? <laughs> Because, A, that's funny. B, she called him boyfriend. That's cute. (laughs) Very cute. That's cute. (laughs) Shall we continue? Sure. They strike a deal. Sean will select four equally bad humans to live in a neighborhood designed by Michael, located in the medium place. Janet creates other residents for this neighborhood with Derek's help. So last week I said I wanted to see Mindy, and boom, here she is. Yeah, for like four seconds. Whatever, she still gets a great line when she says, I don't even know why I asked that. I don't care about the answer. Never mind. And that is literally me with like all small talk, (laughs) which is why I avoid 
people I knew in high school, when I see them on the street, I just don't want to have that conversation. It's so boring. Whatever. So if you see V on the street, don't confront them. Yeah, don't. Just <laughs> leave me alone, please. I would feel so much happier. Pass by each other, a quick little acknowledgement nod, and then we move on with our separate lives. Sounds good. So I'm super excited about the potential of like how this all culminated into this solution of let's redo the, the neighborhood. Mm. Let's redo this experiment. But with rules, guidelines, and Jen on board. Yeah, it is really exciting to get to do this experiment. It's a lot of fun. I, I It's like <sighs> yeah. seeing season one all over again, but behind the curtains, like mm. behind the scenes. And we got kind of that in season two. Yeah, we did. But with a very different intent. Yes. Mm-hmm. Michael was still bad. Yeah, exactly. Michael's good now and he has a completely different goal. Mm-hmm. And he's got his pals with them. Oh, Yeah. And they're in on it, and that's fun too, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we get Derek back, and he's so funny in this episode. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, it's hilarious to see him with all those different martini glasses, like the first one, and you think, oh wow, you know, he's kind of got that like James Bond look, and then he blows bubbles into the martini glass, and you're like, oh yeah. Same old Derek. Still Derek. And he finishes a sentence, like, laughing. He's just like, ha, 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 Derek. Dang it. <laughs> but I think he, he, like, these things just are happening, and he doesn't have any control over them. They're like little hiccups or, like, mm-hmm. little ticks. Yeah. Because so. he looks embarrassed. Like, he's like, oh, I just said Derek. Damn it. Mm-hmm. I didn't mean to say Derek. And then seeing the martini glass filled with olives, and then the one later on with just a single just a lemon. unpeeled lemon. <laughs> just a lemon. Yep. Because why not? <laughs> so he introduces himself to Jason, mm-hmm. who immediately feels threatened. And we get like a, oh, I really love triangle. I don't. I know. They're not going to do it. They're all. not going to do it. They're but it's not. weird. They're it's not. weird. Why are they even like hinting at it in this episode? Because Jason is not the jealous type and he's not generally insecure. He's usually not self-aware enough. To be insecure. I know, but I think at this point, he actually really cares about Janet. So this is kind of painful for him. But she explicitly says to him that she has no feelings that for That doesn't Derek. matter. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't matter. I just, I don't want to go down that road. Let's I know. Let's not go down that I road. Know. Please. But Derek was actually reciting Edgar Allan Poe. He was reciting uh, Sonnet to Science. Ooh, to mm-hmm. Science. To and we're science. kind of doing a science experiment in a way yeah controlled so. experiment with new subjects mm-hmm. data collection it's science words i don't know a lot about science yeah so i'm <laughs> guessing that as soon as derek showed up at the medium place this plunger that he calls like the the kill switch for mm-hmm. janet just kind of appeared in the backyard because there was a, a need new, for one yeah a need for one sure but does that mean that every time Janet and Derek create somebody, there's a new kill switch created? So there's going to be a field <gasps> of plungers or switches or buttons? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. That would be hilarious. If at some point next season, somebody... they just find a giant, like, or the entire beach is just covered in these plungers, but they're like the crappy, like, Derek plunger. Yeah. And then somebody trips and falls and hits a bunch of them. Then they cut to the neighborhood and a bunch of people just collapse. (laughs) They're not all going to have that big thing that says, attention, I have been murdered, I assume. (laughs) Janet probably, or Michael created that, probably. Yeah. But. That would um, be funny if it did. Yeah. (laughs) According to Derek, he's been rebooted about 500,000 times, Mm. which is significantly more than Janet. She was only rebooted 800 plus. Yeah, and yet he's still not great. Right, because he was kind of broken to begin with. Plus, he's still in the medium place. So, like, if he's now basically the medium place Janet. In my notes, I put that he's still flawed to begin with, so he's probably not more powerful than Janet. Yeah, no. But it's yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this means we're going to see a lot more of Derek next season. Yeah, and maybe we'll see very different type of people that he creates versus Janet's people. 
<laughs> so a bunch of bumbling idiots bumping into each other. Oh, this is going to be so fun. Yeah, like every once in a while, the people he makes are just randomly spout their names. Rhonda! Just cuz. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So the rules that Jen lays out are, one, Michael designs the neighborhood. Two, the bad place will choose the subjects, similar level of badness. So no, what was she said? No murderers, no dictators, no one who's ever managed a boy band. And Sean looks really disappointed at that one. (laughs) Number three, no reboots. Uh, Number four, Michael gets five minutes of prep time for each new subject, so he doesn't have forever to plan. Uh, and number five, the neighborhood can be adjusted. So Jen says that Michael can change the neighborhood however he wants, which leaves a lot of room to play. Mm -hmm. Um, but then Jen says like, she's going to oversee everything. And it kind of just feels like something is going to have to happen. Like one of these rules is going to be bent somehow or broken by someone in some way. Right. Like, right. I don't know. Yeah. Having them all laid out like that, like, it was nice. It makes me nervous. Mm-hmm. Is your stomach hurting? A little, a little. I feel cheaty right now in this <laughs> moment. But it's nice to know that Jen's going to be monitoring it and tracking the human's progress. Like, she's actually going to be tracking their point totals. Yeah, and that also means that Sean can't interfere. Exactly. We can't have the bad place creeping in and ruining the experiment. Throwing a Vicky in the mix. Exactly. Or uh, Michael rebooting the subjects 800 times to make it work somehow. Yeah. So it's kind of nice because we're, we're making sure that it's not just going to be like season one where Trevor showed up. And it's not going to be like season two where Michael just went and rebooted them a million times. We're going to actually have a much stricter, more observed experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much more structured. Mm -hmm. The fridge in the background, it's got the fridge magnets, the letters on it that just spell out Derek. Oh, really? (laughs) And when he brings them a, a snack while they're discussing the options, he brings them a medium snack, which includes cheese from a can, half glasses of warm beer, and crackers. Likely unsalted. Gross. Uh, cheese from a can? Spray like, cheese. Just bury me out back because I'm dead. <laughs> Gross. Blech. Janet and Michael use the same design as the original neighborhood. Chidi, Eleanor, Tahani, and Jason prepare to be neighbors to the four new subjects. As Michael's preparing to meet the first subject, Sean tells him that if his experiment fails... His friends will be tortured by demons in a Michael suit. Eleanor comes by to give him a pep talk, and Michael has an anxiety attack. He says he can't do it, and we close on Eleanor panicking. That's a low blow, Sean, but we wouldn't expect anything less. I mean, yeah, his literal life is just a bunch of low blows. Yeah. I think it's really sweet when you see Michael out there... In that with Janet, big empty field, and he summons Janet and then says, "I'm so glad you're here, Janet." He's just so nervous, and her There's... reply is so genuine, so genuine. It's yeah, like me too, me too. Like they're both happy to be in this together, and he kind of looks like he's getting a little misty in that moment. I just, I feel his anxiety. Like he's so nervous. There's a lot riding on this experiment. And he's so comforted to have his oldest friend by his side. It's Mm -hmm. really touching, truly. Yeah, it is. And it's so, it's probably so bizarre for him. Like, he's done this before, but... 800 times. Very different intentions. And Janet wasn't, you know, a caring person. and wasn't a caring friend for him. Mm -hmm. They've gone through a lot together. Yeah, they're pals now. Mm -hmm. They're a dynamic duo, just ready to make some neighborhoods. Aww. (laughs) I wonder if he's somehow going to still have that spoon back from season two. Yes. Yeah. And it's really nostalgic to see the old neighborhood with the frozen yogurt shops, the ladybug. Yes. Nice callback. And Eleanor's clown house. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> of course she wants it back. Mm-hmm. You know, she is nostalgic for it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it would have been kind of cool to have a different house, but it's nice. It's nostalgic. It's definitely familiar territory for Michael and Janet, for sure. It's um, comforting. And, and Eleanor to an extent, right? So I get it. Plus, obviously, you don't have to build an entire new set. So, yeah. <laughs> so then when Michael is talking to Sean and he suggests some different kinds of torture, you know, switching it up a little bit, like teeth flatteners and bees with penises. <laughs> And I swear to God, the two lines that made me laugh the most in this episode have to do with penises. <laughs> okay. Both uh, Derek's line, not to brag, but I almost have a full grown penis now. It's resplendent and mostly functional. <laughs> and Michael's bees with penises. Oh my gosh. Just makes me laugh so loud. And also it would... be more terrifying if those penises were like human sized and not bee sized. So that's what I'm imagining. And it's gross. That's gross. (laughs) It's pretty gross. Yeah. But teeth flattening sounds terrifying. Anything to do with teeth, get anywhere near my face and I'm going to smack yours. And um, yeah, anything to do with penises is funny. I mean... (laughs) Toilet just, humor is never going to go out of style. I felt so immature. I was like, really? These are the jokes that make me laugh the most? Whatever. I just it's, lean into it, I guess. It's just like fart jokes. <laughs> they never, never go out of style. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> Which is probably why bad Janet's always farting. Yep. Um, and calling people dinks. Yeah, that's true. And then when Sean calls Michael their reformed demon daddy, I was like, Oh, man, this show totally knows that some of the audience is thirsty for Ted Danson. Because there's so many people out there, like, loving him. Well, it's look at him. Great. I mean, yes. Have you seen him? Have you yes. been watching he the has show? gravitas. And... He's like a stretched out Alex Trebek. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so the other line that Sean says that confuses me is he said... He thanked Michael for inventing mind wiping? How is that not a thing before Michael? But Michael's probably pretty old. Yeah. But so. What? There's no there's no way that Michael was the first person to ever memory wipe people. Like, come on. Really? No one was like, oh, this is going to be a fun torture technique to, like, give someone something. I don't know, whatever. And then mind wipe them and get to watch their like horrified reaction every like single time. Like in that it Angel episode where that character gets his heart ripped out every day. Yeah. And gets wiped. And he doesn't know what's going to happen. He just knows something bad. Yeah. Right? I don't want to say the name for spoilers. Yes. In case there's people who are still in like the 1900s. <laughs> wow. That's when Angel came out, eh? Uh. Actually, I think it came out. Or in early 2000. Yeah. But it was fun to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, that's to me, seemed a little bit off. Kind of like, yeah, don't really believe that, but fine. We'll just wave it away, I suppose. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he'd be higher up in the, the food chain of the, the bad place employees if he had invented something as, you know, useful as that. Mm-hmm, for sure. But anyway, we'll gloss over that. Yeah, I guess so. Because <laughs> the show certainly did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I do really feel, I do really feel for Michael in this moment. Like he's, I mean, Ted Danson does a great job with his panic and just the look in his eyes before Eleanor even says, you know, we all trust you. Your friends are always going to trust you. The stakes are just so high. And now he has to worry that the only people he cares about in the entire universe are going to feel abandoned and betrayed and grow to hate him if he fails. Mm -hmm. Right. So like so much is riding on him and not only that, but like if they were taken away from him, then he would be truly alone. And that's so sad. Mm -hmm. Although maybe he would be retired if the experiment doesn't work out. There's not really like, the judge didn't exactly say what the consequences would be if it failed. 
So I guess we're going to get to that at some point. Yeah, but still, like you said, like <laughs> his friends would think that he betrayed them. Mm-hmm. So. They would hate him. Yeah. There's a lot riding. and Yeah, and it ups the stakes for Michael too, right? Yeah. They were already real high. <laughs> so I had some questions about this experiment because there are some fundamental differences here. Even though the neighborhood is essentially the same because... You know, we have the same kind of buildings, um, same houses, many of the same people are there in terms of human beings anyway. Michael's still running the place. Janet is still Janet. But it's different because it's not the bad place pretending to be the good place. It's now the medium place pretending to be the good place. And although Michael said that they were going to create challenges for them, he's not going to be intentionally trying to torture them. Right. So doesn't that create a different environment and therefore not the same set of circumstances by which the first experiment was was successful? Right. So I reached out to (laughs) one of the only scientists I know and a very smart woman, um, Anya, at Strangely Literal on Twitter. Um, And I asked her about this, like, would... Would this, uh, would this be bad? Does it have to rely on the exact same circumstances? And she basically told me, no, not really. Like you have to try in many different, um, in many different ways. Uh, she said, sometimes you want things to be a little bit different, uh, randomly on purpose. So like if you were testing the effect of temperature on fruit flies, you'd want to have four different incubators with four different temperatures, that kind of thing. But a lot of her responses made me think that, well, is it really going to be accurate? Like, is the result going to be accurate if we only do it one more time? If you had Eleanor as architect of one neighborhood and Chidi as architect of another and Tahani as architect of hers and Jason and Michael, like if you had several different incubators in a way, like several different experiments going on at the same time that that were very similar but still had some differences that would account for, you know, making sure that it's not just, it's not just the fact that Tahani lived in a big castle like mansion that made them succeed. Or it wasn't that (laughs) Eleanor um, fell in love with Chidi that made the experiment succeed. Like taking out some things so that you understand that any time you have four humans in close proximity in an environment that's stressful, they will change for the better. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, because we do end on Eleanor kind of almost like having to take that role, right? Like she has to step in for Michael potentially. And a lot of people online are theorizing that Eleanor is going to end up presenting herself as the architect of the neighborhood Mm -hmm. and she's going to be the one leading it. Right. Which would be really interesting. And that that's just basically my point is that one experiment doesn't seem like enough. I wonder if they're actually going to mention that in the show. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Having four different experiments, maybe after, you know, Eleanor's version of the neighborhood, they reboot it, do Chidi's version, reboot it, etc, etc. And then you would just run it multiple times Mm -hmm. instead of having one experiment with different sub experiments like sub situations where they have to go through Mm -hmm. because i mean that's what that's what michael and jen are talking about they're you know putting gonna put them through different trials and different challenges but it also sounds like it might be similar ones because eleanor brings up hey, today all we have to do is introduce them to the neighborhood, show them around, and get them to Tahani's party. Right. So is Tahani's party going to be the same thing where she goes ahead and brags about how great she is and everybody else in the neighborhood talks about how great they are I don't and blah, think blah, blah. It's weird because I don't... That's not what Tahani knows that she should do. Like, Tahani now is a little bit better. Mm-hmm. She knows that doing that type of braggery <laughs> and, like, <laughs> you know toting herself and making herself really big and looking down on people isn't a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it's going to be hard for her to do this. I think it might. 
Yeah. And then, of course, Janet's babies. How sophisticated are they going to be? And even Janet. She has to pretend to be like a a robot. A regular Janet. Yeah. From season one, we don't have that Janet anymore. Right. She's so different. So. And if Eleanor does have to step in for Michael, Mm -hmm. can she be imbued with powers? Doubtful. I don't think so. I think she would just present herself as one, but... Yeah, I don't know. Um, Like Anya mentioned, uh, she said, it's good to have different labs repeat the same experiment. You write out the scientific protocol that has all the essentials, kind of like the rules that they have, but let other things like the person and the location and the specific test tubes, etc. vary to make sure that it's not a fluke of specific circumstances. Right. So that's why I brought up the idea of like different experiments with potentially different architects or something like that yeah to see if it's just a fluke Mm -hmm. i like that is it just michael that makes all these people better michael can't make (laughs) half of the world like better in the afterlife or whatever it's just too hard well it'd be nice if that was acknowledged next episode or brought up or mentioned briefly maybe chidi would bring it up and yeah i know chidi is not he's not a science guy he's a philosophy guy i get that but I feel as though Simone would have told him that you have to do an experiment several times, not just twice. Yeah. Because you could have polar opposite results, right? And then have no real conclusion. Mm -hmm. I know about science very little. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much, Anya, for answering my questions. So another question. um, Do you think that we're going to know any of the four humans? I initially thought it was going to be humans that we knew, like maybe some of Eleanor's friends or Pillboy even. Ooh. Um, but at this point, probably not, because I think it might be too hard for our four humans to disassociate with them because mm. they'd be either recognized, for one, mm-hmm. or have to put on a disguise. Yeah. So. <laughs> so after the episode, I actually turned to you and I said... That I thought Eleanor, uh, or actually Kristen Bell, William Jackson Harper, Manny Jacinto, and Jamila Jamil were all going to play those four humans. The new so they humans. Were gonna, yeah, they were going to play different characters. Right, they weren't going to play Eleanor, Tahani, Chidi, Jason. Exactly. So you'd have, like, Kristen Bell is the first person who comes in, and it looks kind of like her. Like, it looks like her, but, you know, she's styled very differently, so she doesn't look like Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Eleanor. And, you know, she'd be introduced as Becky and she was a real estate agent or something like that. And she has a very different personality. I thought that we were going to do that. And I still think that that would be a really funny, like, SNL skit or something, like a joke. Mm -hmm. I completely understand why they didn't do that. But I don't think it's a bad idea. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. (laughs) But I think you mentioned that it would be very difficult as viewers to see them as somebody other than... Tahani, Eleanor, yeah. Jason. And Judy. it would be hard to, I think, keep track. and Yeah. Yeah, and it would kind of feel like, oh, well, it's just Eleanor pretending to be Becky. What do you think is going to happen if the experiment is successful? I don't think it will be. Okay, well... Because well, there's I... another two seasons planned. Yeah. <laughs> but the two seasons could take place... This next... Like, season four could be all about this experiment. And then season five could be about what happens because the experiment is now successful. Well, How do we Let's make back changes? up here because there's no way <laughs> that all of season four would be about the experiment. If anything, it's only going to be next episode, the finale of season three. And they're going to do a montage of a bunch of stuff happening. And then season four is going to be totally different. And they're going to be like recreating movies or they're going to be in upside down world or, you know, having a pajama party. I don't know. <laughs> But like <laughs> slumber party season. <laughs> yeah, you know, that the one weird season, season is like the entire season is just one evening at a slumber party. Yeah. My question is, what happens if the experiment is successful, Jason? What do you think would happen? What is Jen's plan? They have to have plans like they have yeah. to know what's going to happen if it fails to... or if it's successful. They have to do an overhaul of the accounting department. Is Has Jen to... able to do that? Can she just tell neil the head accountant hey dude all this stuff's wrong jen is super old yeah likely older than the accounting department 
Yeah, I'd say so. She's hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say she's older than the accounting department. Um, I think that would just mean that the accounting department has to be fired. I think it has to go higher up than the accounting department. I think she's going to be talking to, like, the powers that be. Well, who does the accounting department report to? Nobody, apparently. I know, right? They're just left on their own. Yeah. I feel like Jen's going to end up doing Michael's job in a way and advocating and telling them that the point system is flawed and needs to be reevaluated. Yeah. I guess we'll find out at some point. Yeah. (laughs) We might be finding out, um... Tomorrow. Yeah. 100%. Okay. Or if you're listening to this podcast later, then you already know. You already know. Oh my god. You're What's in the it like future. in the future? Are there flying cars? Are it's you nice. in the good place? Because our podcast would be. <laughs> so before we finish up this episode, I just want to call back to season two, episode 12. I, lo- I was looking back at my notes and I saw that a listener named Kasim sent us a message saying that they believed that, and I quote, by the end of the show, it will be discovered that medium people, like the group of four, can redeem themselves with some work and then deserve to be in the good place. So I think that the creators of light and darkness that rule over the good place and the bad place will name the group of four and Michael architects of a new kind of neighborhood, the rehabilitation place. Of course, our Janet will be the Janet of this new place. I remember that. So it's pretty darn yeah, close. Yeah, that was a, a good theory. Yeah. I like that idea. Like, this is the, the rehabilitation place where people get better. Yeah. Or if they get worse, then pff, down they go. But, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. No, I like that. And it's not by the end of the show. I so, mean, this is by the end of season three, but would that's this be, really cool. Would this be kind of like a purgatory place? Or it's like before they get to... It's like the, the foyer of... The places, so you kind of. have a trial run. That would be cool if that's what this ended up being, you know, like, but that's, here, now we're That's gonna... risky, though, because if you but put if you a bunch of people bad people are... together, then they're just going to be bad, and then that doesn't give them a chance to be good. But if you have people that are kind of, like, in the middle, right. you know, like the medium people, right? Okay, so some people who hover around a certain area of points, mm-hmm. maybe there's a threshold that they have to meet. Yeah. And not surpass? There's like a final test in a way. A final sorting. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Mm-hmm. So, any last thoughts about the episode? I'm really excited to see where they go for the next episode and what it means for the show. I mean, I really need to rewatch the whole season as a whole mm-hmm. once the next episode, the final episode airs. Mm-hmm. Because I did definitely have a lot of mixed feelings about the earlier episodes. There were a lot of bumps, but I think it might be better upon a full watch. Yeah, especially now that we understand how the point system works and that it's so affected by life being so complicated. That's probably going to shed some interesting light on the first half of the season that Mm -hmm. was criticized for being a little bit dull. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. I'm super excited. And we get to watch it tomorrow. Woo woo. Yeah, you. Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like the show, if you love the show, if you can't get enough of the show, <laughs> please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the very best way for others to find us. If you want to get in touch, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. You can tag your thoughts with hashtag FBullshirt. And we're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. You can email us directly from our website if you prefer. That's www.multiverseradio.ca. We will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Just like that awful. So much better than How I Met Your Mother. Of how I Met Your Mother, where it was mostly Barney and Robin's wedding, and then they. It's all bad. And you don't even care if you spoil it for someone. No, because... I don't. It was terrible. Quit watching it. If you're in the middle, just stop. Stop at season eight. I have strong opinions. Anyway. Actually, stop at season <laughs> one because Ted and Victoria for life. Well, yes. Yes, that's true. I thought you said Ted and Robin. I was like, oh, no. You're allowed to have your own things. You can love things, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and you should feel bad. No, seriously, love what you love and all that stuff. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh 
Oh no. Sammy. <laughs> Uh-oh. He maintains that humans are fundament. <laughs> what? You f***ed it up this time, it's not just me! No, just once though. Damn it. Many times even more so. Yeah. So once we're in the actual restaurant, or what looks like the restaurant, Emmy, unbelievable! Unbelievable! Oh, you go to Whoa, pet her, and then she's gonna jump off. Right now. There we go. That's how you get okay. her to jump off. <laughs> you just go to pet her. Right. Okay.